Good morning, everybody. Get everybody in, get them seated, get them quiet. This kind of falls in with what I'm going to speak about for a minute this morning, like a herd of sheep. Here they come. Come on. I started reading this. I started reading this book this week, and it's a shepherd's view, a real shepherd now, Christian shepherd, and he had his own flock. And it was kind of his view from his aspect of a comparison with his flock and God's flock. And uh, so, in comparison, of course, you got to understand that sheep are <clears throat> low on the intelligence level let's say, but I won't compare that with, with us. So anyway, um, the, the shepherds, it's unbelievable what these shepherds have to go through to keep track of their, their flock. And if a sheep rolls over on its back, it can't get over again. The shepherd has to be right there and get him up again or he'll die. Well, that's sort of like, you know, some of us falling down, but the Lord gets us back up again. And then every once in a while out of a flock, one sheep, he'll just take off. He's gone. And the shepherd has to go and chase him down. Well, God does that with us too. So uh, I just want to read this little bit here. If you ever, any of you, I mean, I'm old, so I've heard it, but uh, um, there'll, no, there'll be no pulling the wool over your eyes. You ever heard that? Well. This shepherd, he says that this is where it came from. When the shepherds are tending their flocks, they're always looking at the sheep and always parting the wool to look at their skin to make sure there's no infection and so on and that the wool is good. And uh, so the sheep, they can't pull the wool over his eyes. He can see right down to their skin. Now. This is what was meant in Psalm 139, 23 and 24, when the psalmist wrote, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, if we will allow this, and we will submit to it, God, by his word, will search us. There will be no pulling the wool over his eyes. Okay, guys. Well, good morning. Okay, now we have an issue, though. The choir just sang, sweet expression on each face. Most of you have sweet expressions. Uh, some of you maybe are still thawing out from being up north. 
But uh, welcome to First Baptist Church of Pine Island. We're glad you're here to worship our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> if you would open your bulletin with me, we'll go over our morning announcements um, here. Uh, today is our potluck. We have fried chicken and and plenty of sides and desserts, so you feel free to stay with us. If you are gluten-free, we got a rotisserie for you, so um, you will want to stay. Um, it'll be a fun um, lunchtime as we enjoy our new pavilion and feel the breeze there, and we're excited about that. So you'll be sure to stay for our potluck today. And then Tuesday men's breakfast at 8.30 at Island Grill and ladies Bible study at 9.30 here in the sanctuary with Psalm 23. Um, we are cruising on through our seven weeks, but if you're like, I'm only here for this week and I would like to come, you still come. Because as Doug was talking about Shepherd, that's what we're learning about in Psalm 23, about how good our God is as our shepherd. And so you'll get a lot out of it even if you're here for just a week. Ladies' exercise in the fellowship hall is at 11. If you would like to participate, ladies, in that, there is no cost for that. If you have any questions about it, you can see Marilyn um, or Alice about that. They would be happy to tell you more information. Wednesday morning, uh, 9.30 at Golden Encouragement Ministry at the Atrium. Um, assisted living, if you're interested in going and singing with the group, they do a mini service for the residents there. You can just show up there and the address is there for you in the bulletin. 11 o'clock is Crafters for Christ, and so ladies, oops, sorry, 10 o'clock. Uh, ladies, you will be sure to uh, attend that. They get lots done for the Children's Hospital and many other ministries. Um, team Kid and Bible study in the evening, and then Thursday, both times for grief share. And I just want to clarify with that, it is an or. You don't have to go to both evenings, but if you would like to participate in grief share, uh, you can do that either at 11 or at 6.30. Uh, some changes to our announcement is on the uh, back of your bulletin. Um, we were going to have the church work day on February 28th, but we decided to go to lunch instead. So, who wants to clean? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So all of a sudden they were quiet, and you mentioned going out to lunch, and they get woohoo! I, I know. And they're like, I don't know if I could participate in the first one, but lunch I can do. Right. So, <laughs> That's right. I I hear you. So we're doing a little road trip. We've talked about it for years. We're going up to Dear Dutchman Restaurant in Sarasota. It's a Amish restaurant there. So, okay, we're hearing it's awesome, so we've, we've heard that. We're going to meet here at church at 9.30. If you wish to go in one of the church vans, feel free to do that. If you're like, nope, I like my own vehicle and want to follow us or meet us up there, the goal is to be up there by 11.30. But we do need to know so we can call ahead that morning with how many are coming. So there is a sign-up on the back if you would check if you're planning on going in the van or if you're going on your own. Uh, that would be great, but we just want to make sure that we have a reservation um, with them before we leave. So that's Monday, February 28th, and then we will get to cleaning the church uh, on March, Monday, March 7th. Um, that will be from around 8 until we're done. We're usually done sooner than 3, but we'd like to do that. If you're interested in coming and helping with that, we should have cleaning stuff here. But if you're like, I love my mop, it's an amazing mop, you bring that mop, all right? And we'll get it to good use um, for that. The Saturday before is our yard sale and car wash for camp. That is Saturday, March 5th. That will be from 8 um, o'clock with the yard sale and then at 9 o'clock um, for the car wash. Some people have already started putting stuff in the fellowship hall. We're on a good start, but we need more. So you clean out those closets, you clean them out. And if you're not sure if you want to part with the item or not, you bring it and then buy it back. Okay, because it's <laughs> awesome. I've done this before with thrift stores, all right? I've gone, and I'm like, and they're like, oh, you really like stamps. And I was like, yeah, they were mine, you know? <laughs> and if you borrowed something to somebody else and you're wondering where it is, maybe come to the yard sale and it might be there too. That could happen yeah. too. All right, so we wanted to be a, 
a fun ordeal, but you bring um, what you can. You do not have to price the items. What we do that day is when people come to cash out, we say, this is for our kids to go to camp. We send anywhere from uh, 15 to 30 kids to camp at Word of Life every summer. So if this is something you'd like to donate to, and, and then they donate what they're able to donate. So we don't need anything marked. Yeah, and along with that, we mentioned it, at least in my group, the students that we have on Wednesday nights, I mentioned it to the junior hires about camp. And they were like, I mean, we, we, we get to go for free? And I said, well, not for free. I said, it's supplied. And I said, here's the amazing thing. I said, and you, if you're visiting with us, you may be like, where are your students? Well, our students are out Wednesday nights. We have about uh, 40 to 60 students out on Wednesday nights. And we bring them for the last seven years. We have brought them to Word of Life Bible Camp in Hudson, Florida for a week. And God has provided for each of those students $400 or above for those kids to spend a week at camp for free because they normally could never afford it. And so we have brought, uh, on average, 25 students a year for the last seven years, and God has supplied the funds to do that. And so as I was mentioning it to the students on Wednesday, I said, here's the amazing thing. I said, think about this. I said, most of these adults have never met you, and they may never meet you. But God loves you so much that even before time began, he knew the money would be provided for you to go to camp. And God uses his people to provide those funds so you can go. That's how special you are. That before the foundation of the world, God knew you'd be going to camp this summer, this week. And he prompted somebody who doesn't know you to send those funds for you to go. And they're like, they had these funny looks on their faces. But that's our God, right? He supplies that way. And uh, we've had people outside the church give to that and inside the church give to that. And so we're excited to say that God is going to provide the monies for our kids, our students, and our young people to go. Because this year we're actually going two weeks. Uh, the first week we're taking uh, junior high and high school. The second week is the littles, the littler ones. What are those ages? Those would be the uh, third through fifth. Third through fifth. And so they'll be going for a week. Ms. Raquel and Joe are taking them for that week. And so it's so exciting because in this world where we see things topsy-turvy and upside down and maybe you're seeing young people and you're like, man, you know, I have a little negativity towards that. Take heart and good cheer. Because there are plenty of young people out there that, that love Jesus, but also that are hungering for Jesus. And when they hear the good news, they come to faith in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's an exciting time here at the church. All that to say is uh, thank you for your thoughtful generosity with all of that. And uh, we have a, a, another item coming up to talk about in just a moment about uh, something we could be generous with. But any other announcements that you have? I think that's all I have. Do, does anyone else have an announcement? Yes, Mary Jane. All right. Awesome. Thank you for that. Eric. Oh. I assume it's your mother, the embarrassed looking lady next to you. <laughs> she still has that authority, Eric. <laughs> she still has that authority. <laughs> Hey, and speaking of birthdays this week, yes. there's also another birthday this week. Yes. I was informed that it's Lucy's birthday this week. Is that right? Yes. We won't yes. mention who told me, but you're married to him. All right? <laughs> so we'll sing happy birthday, I guess. So. Eric, your mom's name. Well, I want to share something that's happened this week about uh, one of our missionaries. Uh, we have missionaries that serve the Lord Jesus Christ in the inner city of Chicago. 
and uh, they serve uh, kids involved in gangs and uh, just a really rough, rough neighborhood. And I know we're going a little long in our announcements. I'm sorry about that. But uh, what happened this week to them is they, they have been saving for a car, and uh, Jordan and Liz Ryan and um, Avery. And so they've been saving for a newer car. And while they were saving for that, they had a situation. And I'm just going to read a little excerpt here, okay? And uh, don't get old because you have to, like, take off your glasses or put on your glasses or whatever that is. Those are bifocals. <laughs> they're, they're progressives. And yet, I know, it's tough. Yeah, move your head up and down. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like being corrected left and right. Okay. Uh, let's see, where are we at? We're at First Baptist Church. We're going to talk about our missionary. That's right. Okay, so they're in, they're in the process of getting a car. Uh, they were scheduling appointments to see cars, but then as they came home uh, from looking at vehicles and possibly buying one, it says, we came home last Saturday to water, water in our living room. Our roof is old and in need of repair, which we knew and were researching possible solutions, but the, water this, the weather this month caused ice dams to build up on our gutters and caused the snow to melt, and the roof then leaked in through our shingles, ultimately into our ceiling. We reached out to inquire about roof repairs and our insurance, but we were denied. Right on the heels of that discouragement, Chicago winters dealt us another blow as the ice melt and snow and rain started yesterday, causing our basement to begin to flood, filling with five to six inches of standing water. As I write this email, we are having our sewer rotted, which they have had done, and know that even more repairs are gonna be needed depending upon what they find. With these expenses hitting us at the same time, we need wisdom of how to proceed, and because they're supported as missionaries, uh, of how to proceed. What should we fix first? Uh, should we hold off on the car? Should we uh, hope that prices are going to stay the same or go down? And with the construction, what are we to do in regards to uh, what can be done now, what can be put off till later? So we're asking for God's provision. And we're asking you to pray and uh, pray for us because this seems so large and insurmountable. But God has provided, us in the, provided for us in the past. We know that he is capable. Please pray for us now and pray for us because we don't want to be too distracted with this as we seek to continue to minister to the kids in the inner city. And so the missions team has decided already uh, we have $2,500 that we're going to be sending from uh, our missions budget, but also uh, we have some giving that's been done uh, to general missions. And so out of those monies, the church is going to send $2,500 to Jordan and Liz to help with this huge expense. So that's going out tomorrow. And what the missions team has asked is if we would receive a love offering on top of that for this couple in need. Because, hey, they're serving in the tough, tough neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods where you talk about and you see on the news, that's where they're at. And so any way we can encourage them would be great. So we're going to receive a love offering next week. If you're like, no, I'd like to give this week, uh, please take an envelope. And this is going to be more of a benevolence offering to them. And so if you're like, hey, I'd like to give to them, on the envelope, not on your check or on whatever, but on your envelope, mark on your envelope, uh, Benevolence Ryan. Benevolence Ryan, because we want to be able to send them a gift that way. But we're going to receive that love, offer love offering next week. If you have any questions in regards to Jordan and Liz's ministry with Inner City Impact, uh, feel free to talk to me after service about that. But uh, they are faithful stewards of of God's work there, and we're we are privileged to uh, support them and serve, help them uh, financially. Anything else we need to say about that? All right. Well, hey, let's pray together. And uh, I know we take time for fellowship here in the beginning to talk about the ministries of the church, but God is doing great things uh, things here on our little island and in Cape Coral, and uh, we're just so grateful that you're here with us today. We've been talking about this idea of unselfing, losing our self-centeredness over these last weeks, and uh, later on in the service as we preach on that, you're gonna hear how God affected my heart with that. Also today, by the way, we're privileged to have from Chicagoland area, friends of ours, the Polizzi family here, 
Frank, how long have we known each other? Fifth, I'm 50, Frank. At least 30 years. At least 30 years, yes. Yes. And then also from Chicago are my brother-in-law and sister-in-law. And she's known me my, all of my 50 years, and so is Tim. So uh, don't ask them any questions. None of that, okay? But no, seriously, welcome. We're glad you're here. And uh, what an amazing thing. Here we are in beautiful paradise. And so we're going to worship our Savior here in just a moment. Uh, question for you. How many of you, now this is going to be a dangerous question, because some of you might, might be like, I don't like that at all. Anybody enjoy some of the Southern Gospel music? Anybody Southern Gospel? Okay, we have a few. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, we have a few. This is that Sunday, so if you don't like it, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to worship Jesus anyway, but uh, we're going to praise the Lord together in just a moment. So the worship team, come on up. We're going to sing together, but we're going to pray first. Would you stand with me as I pray? Lord God, as we gather in Jesus' name today, we want to say thank you, Jesus, that you are the light of the world. Lord, this, this duration of time, Lord, these last years have seemed dark. But Lord, that's when your light shines the brightest. And so, God, we pray that that light would shine through us as we declare, as we proclaim, Lord, that we saw the light of Jesus, that you rescued us from our sin. Oft times, Lord, we admit we, we take that for granted. And for that, we apologize and we repent. Well, Lord, without you, we are nothing. Without the shed blood of our precious Savior, we would not be forgiven. And so, Lord, as we worship, we, we want to say thank you for sending your one and only Son for us that he died for us, that he lived for us, and he rose again for us so we might have eternal life and have your Holy Spirit living inside of us now. And so, God, as we sing these songs this morning, we pray that they would resonate with our hearts as we make these declarations to you. Lord, as we gather today, Lord, I realize each one of us brings a different stress or a different concern. Those things that are unspoken, Lord, we lay those at your feet. For some, Lord, this week maybe it was a doctor's report. For some, Lord, like Jordan and Liz, it was a financial strain. For some, Lord, we got news of our children and a marriage that's difficult. For some, Lord, even in our own homes, we have issues. Lord, you mend those this morning as we cast them to you because you care so much for us. And now, Lord, as we sing, may you be pleased with our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Like a stranger in the night Praise the Lord I saw the light I saw the light I saw the light No more in darkness No more in light Now I'm so happy No sorrow in sight Praise the Lord I saw the light Just like a blind man I wandered along Worries and fears I claim for my own And like the blind man that God gave back his sight Praise the Lord, I saw the light I saw the light, I saw the light No more in darkness, no more in night Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside Praise the Lord, I saw the light I was a fool to 
wander and stray. Straight is the gate and narrow the way. Now I have traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. Celestial shore, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. When the shadows of this life have gone, I'll Like a bird from prison bars that flown, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away To a land where joy shall never end I'll fly away And so, Lord, what a triumphant song for us who know Jesus Christ as Savior. The realization, Lord, that heaven awaits us. It's not something that we have to say we hope so. But, Lord, because of Jesus, we know so. And so, God, we declare that to you publicly, that we are grateful. But, Lord Jesus, this all came at the highest cost of your precious blood. And so what can we do, Lord, but continue to worship and thank you in music by proclaiming that you are all in all and that you are the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. Amen. I fall down, you pick me up. When I am 
dry, you fill my cup, you are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, sing that again, that chorus, just the voices, Jesus, Lamb of God. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. And yes, Lord Jesus, you're worthy of it all. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we like to take a time every Sunday to go to God with our praises and our prayer requests. I know sometimes in a group that's a little unnerving, but that's what makes us family, right? That we can share one another's burdens. There are prayer requests um, in the bulletin that I'll go over on Wednesday evenings. But um, this morning, do we have any praises besides our birthdays? Do we have any praises that we want to give the Lord this morning? Jan. My friend Judy, who we've all been praying for, that had the triple hernia surgery and many complications. I had lunch with her today at Captain, or yesterday at Captain Kahn's. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Try to pass the mic so that the people that are listening on the internet will know what you're saying. There, so she exactly. doesn't have to repeat it. Exactly, exactly. Another phrase that we have, Sybil. Oh boy. <laughs> There you go. Today is our 41st wedding anniversary. Yay! <laughs> and I have a birthday next week. <laughs> All right. Happy birthday. Very, very fun. It's, I'm sorry, I looked down. Is Jim's birthday? No, mine. Your birthday yes. next week. Yes. Next week. Oh, happy birthday, Sybil. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> Older than 41. Yeah. <laughs> so we know that. So any other praises that we have this morning? Things that God has done. Yes, Miss Pat. Several weeks ago, I asked for... <coughs> Several weeks ago, I asked for prayer for a young man who's been my neighbor for a number of years. Uh, he's been fighting leukemia for six years. Uh, been in and out of remission three times. And last week, he got his brother's bone marrow. Oh, wow. Sal is having a really tough time medically. So I would ask for prayer for Sal and for his family. His brother is recovering well from giving the bone marrow. Okay. But Sal, who received it, is having all kinds of complications. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll go right into our prayers prayer requests that we have. Do we have anyone? Scott. Okay, Doug. There's a praise right there. Uh, kind of a praise. Sue is moving a lot better than she had been, so that's a good one. Uh, Sue's mom fell down this week, and she wasn't hurt, so yeah. praise God. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to keep Sue and, and her mom in prayer. Keep me in prayer, too. I'd appreciate sure. that. For those who didn't know, Sue fell um, two weeks ago, about three weeks ago, and broke her arm badly. And so, um, and they care for her uh, hundred and one-year-old mother, and so a uh, lot of need there right now. Yes, Brady. I need con continued prayer from everybody in the church and on the island here for my stepmom and stepdad, their medical problems. 
All right, we'll be praying for Rick and Christine in their medical. All right, I talked to Flossie this week. Uh, her and her, um, Ron, Ron has Alzheimer's badly, so they are um, home. Um, but she said Ron started talking a couple weeks ago, and so that was a praise. She says it doesn't always make complete, but she's got conversation again. So, um, so that was a, a praise that Flossie had. You continue to be praying for Flossie as she cares um, for all of Ron's needs. Any other praise or prayer requests that we have? Sybil. pronounce it from the waist down okay and it it attacks the nerves in your body and paralyzed so she can't feel anything from the waist down she's oh, in the wow. hospital okay and uh, her in I don't know if she didn't have enough insurance or the insurance not paying for it and she only has one more treatment and then they don't know what they're going to do with her okay okay and then uh, I found my brother's lung biopsy scheduled for March 2nd. March 2nd for David. Yeah. Lung biopsy. All right. Any other before we go to the Lord? John, do you have your hand up? Oh, there you go. Peter. Uh, my, my, my prayers go out if all of us could uh, join all of our children that are out there in this world and all temptations and the sadness are all, as we learned this morning about the dark room, and uh, my daughter, Caitlin, uh, particularly, is going through a difficult valley, and uh, like to, uh, prayers to all of our children and Caitlin. We sure will. <laughs> Uh, Jennifer's over on the other coast with one of our grandkids, uh, just spending time with her mother. So just pray for safety as she would be traveling back sometime tomorrow. And pray for her husband, who's so lonely. <laughs> oh, poor fella. She left this morning, didn't she? <laughs> oh, yesterday. <laughs> We'll give you a doggy bag after the potluck. Make sure you're fed and all that good stuff. All right, one more. We got Linda. I have a praise. I'll probably embarrass them, but I'm so happy to see Joel and Jeannie back yes. from Virginia for a visit. Yes. They used to snowbird down here and um, moved back up north a couple years ago. And, and so uh, it's very good to see both of you, both of you. I'm sorry? Oh, you're in Virginia. <laughs> I think Virginia's still north. I, I'm very safe usually saying north to anything when we're this far south, but uh, let's go to the Lord with our, our um, praises and prayer requests. God, you are so awesome. And though we could go by person to person and say, what has God done in your life this week, or what do you need God to do in your life this week? We know you can personally handle each one of those things. And that just blows our mind because we just can't understand how you can be there for each one of us in each one in the world. But you can, and that's what makes you our mighty God. Lord, we praise you for these things like Judy's surgery going well and, and Sybil and Jim's anniversary and the birthdays. Lord, we praise you for the ones that have traveled down here like Joel and Jeannie and Frank and Jen and their family and Cheryl and Tim and just many faces here that, that are new to us. We just thank you for the traveling mercies that you gave each one. Lord, we Lift up in prayer for you, Pat's neighbor with leukemia. Lord, we praise you that this bone marrow worked, but we, but we just ask that the complications would subside and healing would begin. We pray for continued healing in Sue. We pray for healing in Rick and Christine's life, Randy and Kathy's daughter Dina with this nerve problem, and David with his cancer, Lord. 
We pray for the numerous ones that have family members with cancer as well. Lord, we thank you that Jennifer was able to spend time with her mom and her grandson, but we do ask for safety for her. And Lord, as Peter has reminded us, I think we each can think of a family member or a child that needs prayer this today. But we particularly want to pray for Caitlin this morning, Lord. You know what she's going through, why she's going through, what the outcome will be. You have gone before her. Lord, I just pray that you would become ever real in her life. That she would see her need for you. And that she would realize that the faith that her parents have is just not a fad or what they're going through in right now, but it's a relationship that they have with you. Help them as they trust her to you during this time. God, we love you, and we need you, and we can't live without you. So be with us as we continue to praise you. We learn from your word. I pray that you would be with Pastor Jim this after, or as he is sermon today. Lord, be with us as we fellowship later. Lord, we also praise you and thank you for this offering we're about to receive. I pray that it will be used for your glory and your kingdom. We know it will, Lord. Help us to use it wisely. We praise these things in your name. Amen. You know, as we were praying there, and praying for loved ones, it's so great today to know that the same God is on that mountain. He's in the valleys for us and he'll see us through them and he'll put us back on those mountains amen we're going to do a song this morning done by the mccamies as it's uh, southern gospel week and uh, called guide on the mountain life is easy when you're up on the mountain you've got peace Jesus, 
great hymn of the faith, one of my favorites, uh, Victory in Jesus. Perhaps you've sung it before, maybe. But uh, what a great reminder of the victory we have in our Lord and Savior. Let's sing together, Victory in Jesus. Give me a minute. Hold on a minute. I just thought I was done. I heard an old, old story how the Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary. To save a wretch like me, I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood i heard about his healing of his cleansing power revealing how he made a lame to walk again Cause the blind to see And then I cried Dear Jesus Come and heal my broken spirit And somehow Jesus came And brought to me the victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever He sought me and bought me With his redeeming he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has brought for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing And the old redemption story And some sweet day I'll sing up there The song of victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever He sought me and he bought me With his redeeming blood He loved me As you're seated, I need you to take out that little crown that you were given on the way in. Interestingly, as these were being passed out, someone said, I want one with emeralds on it. And I'm like, what do you expect for eight bucks for a hundred? But uh, anyway, I think you would agree with me that we live in a culture that is very self-glorifying. We're all about, look at what I've done. Look at me, look at what I've accomplished. I'm not much for those uh, award shows, you know, where they have all the people being paraded up front for their awesome works or whatever they are, and to hear speeches of thanking everybody and their mother about their work and that sort of thing. Chris likes to watch a little bit of it because of the outfits, she says, but uh, uh, I'm not about that either, but we've been journeying together since the first of the year, talking about unselfing. Unselfing is not a word, I think I made that up, but the idea is, is we're looking to lose our self-centeredness. Thank you, Pastor John, for speaking on love last week. I appreciate that. Appreciate you affording me a Sunday off and spending time with my son and Tim. Uh, we were in Pompano Beach on a, on a scuba dive trip, so it was, it was spectacular. It was cold. 
I literally jumped in the water and, well, I'll just leave it at that. It was cold. <laughs> it was just like, <gasps> leave a little more air in my regulator. But anyway, we're talking about unselfing and we're thinking about this idea. We've been talking about losing our self-centeredness in our marriages, in our walk with Jesus. We've been talking about losing our self-centeredness in regards to our self-righteousness. Uh, that one in particular, uh, as I was studying and having time with the Lord with it, it was amazing how God hit my heart on different things with that. Remember we talked how we say things like, well, why would they do that? They do that because they're lost. They do that because they're unsaved. They don't know any better. And it's almost pharisaical, right? Where I look at them down my nose and say, in pride, my pride, really what I'm saying is, thank God I'm not like them. This week, we're moving on to talking about self-glory, puffing up our chests as if we can do anything, anything apart from Jesus. The idea is that in the shadow of the cross, I need to constantly be aware and on my guard against self-glory and at times repent of it. I just need to be honest with you. I don't like that statement. My brother-in-law says, you're not being honest with me other times. And it's like, no, I am. It's just I want to be clear. As I was studying it this week, I realize how much pride I have left in me. And as I was thinking about this idea of self-glory and crowning myself as king with such a little puny crown in comparison to the glories of God and my little puny achievements as if they mean anything, I was on my knees repenting. And I was just like, Lord, I, I'm so sorry for taking credit. Lord, it's, it's, it's all about you. Apart from you, I can do nothing. Nothing. But it's, it's, it's embedded in, into us, right? Tell everybody what you've done. Make known what you've done. Take the credit. You deserve the credit. Get your name out there. The scripture tells us something different. 1 Corinthians 10 reminds us that whatever we do, Eating, drinking, no matter what it is, do all to the glory of God. So no matter what we're doing, we're to do it for God's glory, but then we're also to give him the glory and the thanksgiving. Because here's the reality. Self-glory, we're going to look at the, the little definition we have of it in just a moment. But all of us, we have all maybe memorized this verse, but it, it hit me afresh this week that I fall short of God's glory because I'm a sinner. I fall short of God's glory because I'm lost without him. And yet, why do I look to receive any glory? You see, self-glory is the act of praising oneself and glorifying oneself when it's undeserved, to an undeserved extent. You and I, apart from Jesus, we deserve hell, don't we? Our sin separates us from God, and because we're separated from God, and because our sin is so overwhelming in our lives, it's just who we are, we are sin, we are lost, and because of that, I deserve nothing but condemnation. Apart from Jesus, I am lost, and that's the glorious good news of the gospel, that Jesus saves us. And he saves us to do the works he's prepared for in advance for us to do. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. And so as we're giving us this idea of self-glory, I, I was combing through history, and I came across one person who is, and this is not going to be a word either, but I'm going to use it, who is the most self-glorifier ever. And it's this man. Yeah, right, the epitome of evil. So Emma, if I get this wrong, my daughter is a history buff, and uh, I was going to have her come up here, but here's what she said. She dad, said, Dad, I, would, I could talk about Stalin until 1210. And I was like, well, we don't have till 1210. Your mother was very explicit on the instructions. I need to be done by 12, 1205, which is going to turn into 1210 or 1215. So anyway, but this man, Stalin, you may be familiar, he was the most evil dictator ever. 
He would do things, and his mom wanted him to be a priest, and he got in the wrong crowd and all these things. Starved 20 million of his people. He outlawed religion. Had every religious item removed from the home. And gave everybody a picture to put in its place, so daily they were to worship Stalin. You don't get any more self-glorifying than that. On top of that, he was so paranoid of losing power, he killed off all but three of his generals in his army over the course of time. And we may look at him and say, boy, he was all about himself, glorifying himself. Look at, I mean, here, read this with me. The Soviet propaganda machine confirmed upon Stalin the title of father of nations, so not Mother Russia, father of nations, and equally modestly, the sun that lights up the whole country. Like God, he had to be worshipped every single day. And if you talked against that, death or the gulag, which was death. Some of you may say, well, I'm not like Stalin. True. But we have the possibility of being like him in this respect. We may look to glorify ourselves rather than God in situations. We may start to say things like, look at what I've done. In fact, just a, a quick self-inventory before we get to our text. You may say, well, I don't, I don't self-glorify. Well, well, let's ask ourselves these questions or look at these statements. Do you parade in public what should be kept private? Now, let me take that a step further. Do you parade in public what God has done, and yet you leave out his name when you're telling somebody about what has happened? Rather than saying, look at what God did in this situation. God provided at the last minute. Do you say God provided, or do you say Look at how I provided for that person. That's robbing God of glory. Are you too self-referencing in your conversation? All of a sudden there's a conversation, and it's funny because as soon as I started going over these things, as soon as I was in conversation, I was like, I struggle with these. Don't tell no one. But I struggle with some of these. Because I'll be telling a story and I'll be like, oh wait, that's like and I switch it to be about me. And I was like, Lord, I, I'm sorry. And then I also, do you, uh, uh, when you talk, I talk when I should listen, I interrupt and I continue to make it all about me. I could care less what the other person's saying is what you're saying. You're looking to glorify yourself. Maybe you care too much about what others are saying of you and look for the praise of others by, by, by losing God Telling what you've done, maybe you've done something and you're looking for that pat on the back and that thing of, hey, great job, wow, you're amazing. My little puny crown. You see, self-glory is what the apostles were about. Self-glory is what they are arguing about in Mark's gospel. Turn with me to the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 10. And it's interesting because as we turn to Mark, the apostles have been journeying with Jesus. This is right before the triumphal entry. This is right before uh, Jesus heals Bartimaeus. And we're going to look at a very familiar story to us. Maybe not in Mark's gospel. Maybe you know it from Matthew's gospel. And so what we have is Mark's perspective of an event that took place with James and John, the sons of Zebedee. In Matthew's gospel, it'll say uh, that the mother of James and John brought them to Jesus. But in this gospel, it says that James and John made a request of Jesus. And so some people will say, is this a different event? Well, why isn't the mother bringing them? No, no, no. It's a total picture. They were all conspiring together with the mom. So it's as if James and John are speaking this, and they respond with this, to, to put themselves in a position in the kingdom of God that they knew nothing about. 
They're looking to glorify self. Now, now catch this. So this is after Jesus has already stated three times that he would die, that he would be scourged. Just before these verses, in fact, Jesus is saying the third time very explicitly that he's going to die. He's going to be scourged. And we know from chapter 9 that the apostles have already been arguing about who would be the greatest. So it's not like just the two wanted to be the greatest. No, this argument has been going as if it's been ongoing amongst the apostles. Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to have the highest position? See, it's all about me, all about my self-glory. And so as we come to the passage, we have to have these ideas in the back of our minds because as this fleshes itself out, we're going to see two guys who, who, who have the wrong perspective of self-glory. Look at verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, notice, notice the surface respect, teacher. Thank you for getting our food ready. I appreciate that. They said, would it bother you? I said, no, we want the food ready. So anyway, so, but they said, teacher. False humility, right? Teacher. Look at these next words. Jesus has just got done saying, I'm going to die. I'm going to be scourged. I'm going to suffer. All this stuff's going to take place. But yeah, look, teacher. We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Did you catch that? Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Isn't it funny how sometimes we approach Jesus this way? As if we know better than he does. Just, just check your prayer request life. Rather than saying, Lord, your will... Right? Lord, we want this to go smoothly. Lord, if you just give me a little extra. Almost like two weeks ago, Lord, thank God I'm not like that. You see, it's, it's about us rather than about him. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about my self-glory. It's about his glory. And he said to them, now, now, now Jesus is so good, he says to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right and one at your left in your glory. Boy, it's funny how they pick and choose what they want to hear of Jesus, right? I mean, Jesus is talking about his suffering, but he's also talking future glory as he's been with the apostles. And so they're almost picking and choosing of what Jesus is saying. And yet what they're asking, they have no clue. What they think they're asking is if, hey, grant us this request. Let us sit at your right. Let us sit at your left. Those highest places of honor. You see, self-glory has a wrong-heartedness of how God views greatness. Meaning that my heart, when, I, when I'm not in tune with the Lord, when I look at what's great, it's always opposite of what God thinks is great. This is the apostle's attitude. Lord, let us be at your right. Let us be at your left. Lord, give us whatever we ask of you. And yet, if we truly remembered who we were before Jesus and who we are because of Jesus, these words would flee, flee from our mouths. There would be a humility there rather than a self-glorification. You see, self-glory also shows up in our assessment of, self, of self-importance. Look at that next verse. Or in these verses in the context here. Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. Look at how their picture of self is. They think that they are so important that they deserve to go to Jesus, who's done all these miracles, who has raised somebody back to life, who has healed people, who has made claims that he is God, who has talked about his suffering, and yet these two, 
And it's not the first time, because remember, they're arguing in chapter 9, who's the greatest? I'm the greatest. No, no, you're the greatest. And it wasn't Muhammad Ali, by the way. So anyway, so they're arguing like that, and, and, and their attitude is, we're so important that we're going to ask God, we're going to ask Jesus to do whatever we ask. Self-importance. leads to self-glorification, which shows up in our wrong assessment of who we are. You see, apart from Jesus, apart from Jesus, we're lost, we're broken, we're incapable of saving ourselves. And then even with Jesus, right? There's not a day that goes by where we don't fall short. We constantly sin. We constantly make mistakes. We constantly mess up. And even on our best day, we still get frustrated. I mean, you leave here at 10 o'clock on a Monday going towards Cape Coral. That'll show you your true colors. <laughs> All right? Oh, yeah, somebody said amen over here. That's right. That, and so, so, so that's why. We need to make sure that we root out this glory of self in our lives. That, that, that we're, we're, we're taking ourselves and saying, Lord, apart from you, I am nothing. Lord, apart from you, I, I am not important. He's important. Lord, help me to get out of the way so you work through me. It goes so counter to our culture. Self-glory drives us to the wrong attitude of self-prominence. And power. And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right and one at your left. In that culture, those were the prominent places. Those were right under the rulership, the throne. What I found interesting did you catch this? To sit at your right hand? I think the Bible says. There's already someone there. You have the Father and you have the Son at the right hand of the Father. So, so they're so lost. They're so wrapped up in themselves. Really what they're saying is elevate us to the same status. You and I need to make sure in our hearts that we are not doing that with the Lord. When we stop saying, Lord, whatever your will is, your will be done, when that loses out of our prayer life, caution. Because what we're saying is, God, we know better. Let me tell you what I want you to do. How's your attitude towards the Lord this morning? Where are you looking to bring self-glory to yourself? Now, as we've said, these aren't the only two. Because remember, the two are like, hey, you know, we want, I was going to shine this in your face, but I won't. All right? So they're like, hey, we want the spotlight, right? And I have this one on, and by the way, it does that too in case if we have an emergency. But anyway, but they want the spotlight, Right? And rather than the others that are there, the other apostles, rather than them saying, glad we didn't do that, glad we didn't put ourselves on the level of Jesus, glad we didn't put ourselves uh, 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 in that situation where we came and said, do whatever we want, whatever we ask as if God's a genie. No, no. They actually become angry. And not rightly. They become indignant, it says, because they want the spotlight on them. They were just arguing in chapter 9. Who's the greatest? I'm the greatest. No, no, I'm the greatest. No, no, I'm the greatest. Wait, these two are asking for the spotlight? How could they? That angers me. Not because it's wrong, but because I want it. Do you know some of us are like that? We see someone getting the spotlight, and maybe they don't even want it. And we're like, 
I can't believe they're getting the spotlight. I want that spotlight. You see, our culture is all about self-glory. And this is opposite of God's economy. This is opposite of what God desires. You see, the, the rest wanted the spotlight, and they get angry. They're angry because they feel like it's unjust to them. Are you angry because you're not getting the spotlight? As we, we have a little part two that's not going to take as much time, but I, I want to sum this up for us. Making parallels of, of what they're asking, what we ask. You see, they had their demands, right? You see, self-glory brings about demands of God. Self-glory in our lives brings about demands of God, right? We have ours. God, if you don't do this, and we'll maybe even say, hey, here are my, here are my demands, just like the apostles. God, I know who I am. I know what you should do. I know what place I deserve. And then this last one. And let me tell you how to do it. That's where self-glory leads. So we need to be filtering this through our hearts to say, you know what, God? I, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be demanding like that because, one, it's sinful. Two, it's self-glorifying. And three, we need to, in humbleness, come before God and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm lost without you. The opposite, God, I don't know what to do. Perfect spot to be in. God, I, I don't deserve any credit. God, I can't tell you how to do anything. Because, Lord, I, I don't know how to do anything myself. It's the reverse. Self-glorying is looking to glorify self. The opposite of this is what Jesus is going to be talking about. He's going to be talking about self-surrender. And it's literally the idea of surrendering oneself, our will, and our emotion to the Lord. So this poses a great question for all of us. When you became saved and you placed your faith and trust in Jesus and received him as Lord and Savior, that day you surrendered yourself to him. So positionally you were moved under the blood of Jesus. Now, that's an absolute truth. But there's also the truth that while I'm positionally sanctified, saved under the blood of Jesus, there's also the aspect of I need to be maturing towards Jesus as I become more like him. And so that takes not only that initial surrender, but it takes a daily surrender to say, Lord, thank you for saving me. Positionally, I'm under the blood of Christ. I'm moving towards Jesus, and I'm looking to die to self daily. I'm looking to surrender my life to you daily. So that's why when I was on my knees this week, it just hit me like a ton of bricks all over again, afresh in a good way. Lord, you are the only one who deserves this glory. Lord, I'm sorry for those corners in my heart that are not yet surrendered to you. And here's the thing. We all have them. So lest you sit there and say, what are Pastor Jim's corners? What are your corners? Because we all got them. And you might be thinking the big things. Well, I don't drink, I don't do this, I don't... Oh, whoa. Do you let fear drive you? Do you let worry move you? Do you let pride of accomplishment sneak in there without giving God credit? Do you only tell the truth when it's convenient? 
You see, self-surrender has to happen. Self-surrender requires us to understand Jesus' mission. Jesus is like, you're asking me this, but you have no clue what you're asking. You do not know what you're asking. He's like, you don't know. Because then he goes on to say, are you able to drink the cup or go into the baptism? And some people are like, well, what is that about? I'm glad you asked. Because self-surrender happens understanding Jesus' mission, but his mission of atonement. Look at it here. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? The cup here, by the way, in the Old Testament, in parts of the New Testament, picture God's pouring out of judgment and wrath. And Jesus was able in the Old Testament to pay for God's pouring out of his wrath. And what the apostles and what Jesus, are, Jesus is saying to the apostles here is he's saying, look, can you participate in this cup? No, you cannot. Because he's the only one that could fulfill paying for God's wrath. It's the picture of atonement, his mission. He has just said in the previous verses, this is what's going to happen with my death, paying for God's wrath. And so... Imagine being the apostles and hearing this, by the way. They, they would totally understand where Jesus is coming from. And yet they disillusioned themselves to only hear what they wanted to hear. And so Jesus is like, you can't have the same experience because you're not capable or able to be the cup as I'm the cup. And we see that Jesus talks about that in the New Covenant, right? Then he talks about baptism. Self-surrender, ha uh, self-surrender happens because of Jesus' death. That's the worst wording I've ever seen, by the way, in a point, right? I should reword that. Uh, 1038a, or to be baptized with the baptism which I'm baptized. And so what Jesus is saying is he, the picture here uh, for the apostles is not necessarily uh, the baptism we know of, the picture here is the idea of being immersed into the situation of suffering and death that Jesus is going to face. And so as Jesus is mentioning to this to the apostles, imagine hearing that and being like, whoa, I, want, I wanted to be elevated. He's talking about suffering. I wanted to glorify self. And he's talking about surrendering his life. It's interesting because Jesus continues in 39. He says, the cup that I drink, you will drink. So, so while it's not salvation death or atoning, he is foretelling the suffering that they would face. In Acts 12, 2, James is martyred for his faith. And then John is exiled to Patmos to live out his days, where he writes Revelation. Can you imagine almost the haunting of this? The cup that I drink, my death. You're not going to experience what I experienced, but you will die. And you will die for my glory. Boy, that poses a deep question for us all, doesn't it? Would you be willing to die for his glory? Some of us would say, absolutely. D.L. Moody was asked that question. And he says, if it were today, I would have to say no. But if it were to come, God would grant me the grace to do what he wanted me to do. And the same is true of James and John. You see, this death that they're going to experience is also required of us. It's a physical death, but a daily death. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. 
You see, this, this thing of self-glorification, of living for self, requires us to die daily, to take up our cross daily. Because greatness in the kingdom is categorized by self-surrender and not self-glorification. Look at 43. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be what? Your servant. And whoever will be first among you must be slave of all. You want to be great in God's kingdom? You've got to lose all aspects of self-glory. You've got to be willing to say, Lord, I don't care about credit. Lord, I don't care about my self-glory. What I care about is you and serving you and serving others. This is what put me to my knees. Because I was like, Lord, at times, it's tough to serve others. It's tough to say, God, I'm willing to lose my freedom to be a slave to you to do what you want me to do. Because that interrupts my schedule. Oh, wait a minute. That's about me. That's about what I know best. It requires us to sacrifice. You may be sitting here this morning, and as I wrestled with this, I said, Lord, how, how, how do I move? Lord, I, I don't want to leave my office. And I'm a work in progress, by the way. And Lord, I don't, I, I don't want to be this person. I, I want to step closer to you and lose this whole thing of self-glory because really, it's ugly. It's sinful. Lord, how, how do I do that? First thing is we have a spiritual understanding that only God is to do glorification and is do that glory. So we need to realize that when people start praising us, we need to immediately bring that to the Lord and to turn that toward the Lord and say, Lord, this is because of you. And then to that person, we also need to say, isn't it great what God has done? That has to become part of our vocabulary. Secondly, we glorify him through giving of ourselves as an offering and sacrifice. Romans reminds us of this, to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, to renew our minds, transform our minds. So it's going to require you and require me to dig into God's word on a continual basis. It's going to require me to acknowledge my, my, my sin issue with it and say, Lord, I'm sorry for when I've taken credit. Lord, I'm sorry for when I've spoken and I shouldn't. Lord, I'm sorry for being selfish and wanting things about me. Lord, I, I repent of that and I turn to you. God, please forgive me. It requires humility. nearly 60 years later. Imagine being John. You're looking back over your life and the crucifixion's taken place. The scourging, the beating, the, the road and the nails and all this is done. And you're wondering what's going on. And you're in that room and Jesus appears alive. Imagine time going on and you're paying because you're a devoted follower of Christ. Imagine being exiled because of your faith to the island of Patmos. And you're there till you die. Imagine reflecting back and saying, I can't believe my brother and I. I can't believe we said, Lord, whatever, you, whatever we ask, do it. 
On Patmos, he has visions of grandeur. And the old son of Zebedee reminds us in our last book of the Bible. Look at how far he's come. From, Lord, do what I want, how I want, when I want, to this. Only you, Lord. Only you are worthy. Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. What an amazing transformation. This is what he writes. Imagine him looking back and thinking about that puny little crown that he wanted. And him having visions of Jesus being thrown in heaven at the right hand of God. You and I get caught up in this. This morning, we have a time of response, and I know we're a little long. I'm sorry about that, but I, I feel led to do it. We're going to play a song here. And just as your sign to the Lord, and, and this is not everybody, I totally understand. But some of us, some of us, perhaps we've been hogging the spotlight a little bit. And this morning we want to say, you know what, God? I'm sorry. I, I want to lose that little crown. I want to lose that self-glory and I want to be about you. If that's your desire, we're going to play a song that's going to play twice. It's really short. I'd invite you just to come up and say, you know what, Lord? It's not about my glory. It's about your kingdom and your glory. So if you desire while we're singing, just feel free to uh, walk to the front and throw your little crown in the bin and say, Lord, my puny glory, it's not about me, but it's about you. Isn't that just your sign of commitment before the Lord? We're family here. There's no judgment. This is a safe place. But sometimes we need to have those moments where we make our declaration to say, God, it's only you who deserves the glory. Let's sing together. Let's stand together. And we'll sing this twice. Um, we have to... All the saints and angels bow before your throne. cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing, you are worthy of it all.
saints and angels bow before your throne all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing you are worthy of it all our statement today, that you deserve all glory and honor and praise. In our hearts, Lord, we have asked for forgiveness when we've robbed you, and you have forgiven us. Lord, at this church, we want to be about your glory and not of ourselves. We want to boast in you alone and your accomplishments, Lord. And we give thanks. We thank you for this food we're about to partake in, Lord, as a group of individual people, Lord, that have gathered under Jesus' name. We pray you'd bless our fellowship and our conversation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thanks for being with us. Please stay for lunch. We have so much chicken. I ate it last time twice. So, so please stay and eat and feast with us.